So it's the mid-1850s, and you're Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. You've been writing for almost 20 years, from the late 1830s when you got popular acclaim for your short lyric poems like Psalm of Life, through to the 40s where you wrote plays like the Spanish student wrote abolitionist verse, wrote Evangeline, arguably the greatest long narrative poem of the American century up to that point. You've gotten married. You've gotten a great job at Harvard. What do you do with yourself in the 50s? Well, if you're Longfellow, you do two things. You decide that you want to write full-time, and you decide that this whole pesky teaching business, yeah, it worked well for a while, but you want to dedicate yourself full-time to writing. In the mid-1850s, Longfellow scrapes together enough money. He inherited some money from his wife's family. Um, he had been uh, very, very um, savvy in how he published his books. He kept the printing book plates, and he would uh, basically rent them to publishers who wanted to print his books, and he always got them back. And so he was very savvy at protecting the copyright of his books. And so he made enough money through that and through a very advantageous, socially, uh, marriage that he could retire from teaching and write full time. Two of the major works he writes in the mid-1850s to late-1850s are The Song of Hiawatha and The Courtship of Miles Standish. Now, both of these, both of these poems are rather lengthy. Um, they kind of take the model of Evangeline of being over a thousand lines and kind of start with that as a basis and move much, much further. So uh, Song of Hiawatha is a good 200, 250 pages in most editions. And The Corporate Ship of Miles Standish is about as long as Evangeline is. Now, we're not going to talk a lot about the Song of Hiawatha. Um, Song of Hiawatha is how it's usually pronounced, though um, Longfellow pronounced it Hiawatha. Um, the Song of Hiawatha deserves a, a series in its own right. Its main character is not a man, or not a woman, but a man, a Hiawatha, though there are female characters in it, like his grandmother Nokomis and his wife Minnehaha, um, who are worthy of note, but they don't really rule their respective poems. Hiawatha is primarily about a male hero. The next poem where you do have a strong female heroine who kind of takes over and guides the poem is in The Courtship of Miles Standish. Now, this was published in 1858, so it's been, uh, it's been almost, uh, almost 20 years since Longfellow's career took off. He's really mid-career, and Courtship of Miles Standish is a relatively new kind of subject for Longfellow. Uh, if you're familiar with who Miles Standish was, he was a historical person. Uh, he was a captain of the small group of military uh, of, of soldiers and military officers uh, who accompanied um, the Mayflower uh, when they came over to America during the colonial, colonial era. And so uh, the courtship of Miles Standish in his name makes us feel like, oh, this is going to be about you know, this uh, belligerent captain. In fact, that's a phrase that is, that is used in the poem, the belligerent captain of Plymouth. Um, but it turns out that primarily this story isn't going to be about Miles Standish. It's going to be about the woman he tries to court. Now, the story is a very familiar one um, in, uh, in romantic literature. You have two men um, who are very different in demeanor. Uh, one is Miles Standish, a brusque, uh, pugnacious, um, not the most attractive character, but sure of his strength and superiority and desirability. Uh, and he decides, you know, it's, it's high time he take a wife, and he decides there's this uh, fine, virtuous maiden in town, Priscilla Mullins, and uh, she's the one who's going to marry him. But of course, being an army captain, having lots and lots of military responsibilities, he doesn't have time to woo her. But luckily, he has a roommate, John Alden, a sensitive, poetic type who's always sitting there reading books and composing elegant letters. And so he decides, I'll have my friend, John Alden, woo Priscilla for me. Now, you know where this is going, audience. Uh, Priscilla, of course, uh, will not take kindly to being wooed uh, by one man in the stead of another, and John Alden, our sensitive poetic type, uh, may turn out to be a more suitable match uh, for Priscilla than Miles Standish. Now, it's interesting because both Miles and John 
uh, are comic characters. John is just too fumbly. He, he's sort of a uh, Hugh Grant and Notting Hill, if that cultural reference works for you, uh, kind of always stumbling over his words. Um, he can write elegantly, but uh, he's, he's our bumbling protagonist. Miles Standish uh, is pugnacious. Uh, he's always running off to fight the Indians. Um, there's a real ambivalence in this poem about um, the, uh, the ethical status of Plymouth. Um, the main ca characters who live in Plymouth, who aren't part of the military, are, are depicted as virtuous. But uh, any military endeavor um, against, uh, against the indigenous peoples is seen as, as um, violent, as a violation. Um, Longfellow had very little time for any sort of military conquest, colonial violence. Um, then again, he's praising uh, certain characters who are colonists. And so th there's, there's a complicated, uh, complicated colonial conversation that we could have about courtship of Miles Standish. But in the end, the poem isn't as interested in big political, serious historical questions in the same way that Evangeline is. It's interested in this awkward love relationship between Priscilla Mullins and John Alden. So I want to read to you uh, what happens when John Alden comes and presses his friend's suit of love to Priscilla. We really get, uh, we really get a sense for who this heroine is going to be. Mute with amazement and sorrow, Priscilla, the Puritan maiden, looked into Alden's face, her eyes dilated with wonder, feeling his words like a blow that stunned her and rendered her speechless. Till at length she exclaimed, interrupting the ominous silence, if the great captain of Plymouth is so very eager to wed me, why does he not come himself and take the trouble to woo me? If I am not worth the wooing, surely I am not worth the winning. That is the way with you men. You don't understand us. You cannot. When you have made up your minds after thinking of this one and that one, choosing, selecting, rejecting, comparing the one with the other, then you make known your desire with abrupt and sudden avowal and are offended and hurt and indignant, perhaps, that a woman does not respond at once to a love that she never suspected, does not attain at a bound the height to which you have been climbing. This is not right nor just, for surely a woman's affection is not a thing to be asked for and had only for the asking. When one is truly in love, one not only says it, but shows it. John Alden is taken aback. He doesn't know what to do. He's tried to present his suit of love uh, for his friend. And then uh, to put the nail in the coffin, Priscilla archly smiled and with eyes overrunning with laughter, said in a tremulous voice, why don't you speak for yourself, John? So <laughs> Priscilla, uh, who, when, when Miles Standish talks about her, it, it, it very much is, uh, well, she's virtuous and young and obviously wants a good husband, so she'll, you know, she'll want to marry me. Priscilla just kind of fires back, not just with a offended no, but this sort of philosophy of, uh, of wooing and this uh, really, uh, um, uh, really insightful analysis of the, the problems that men have. They deliberate, they decide, you know, between this one and that one, and then say, well, she'll marry me, and she just has to deal with it. And she basically says, look, you don't understand. Uh, you don't understand people. You don't understand women. Um, I understand you, and you don't understand us. And, you know, this is all in a comic um, scene, right? Priscilla is not, you know, uh, writing a feminist diatribe. And yet, I think, uh, from a feminist perspective, we can see that Priscilla is articulating something that's going to be articulated a lot in the 20th century um, about um, men's expectations for women um, and women uh, chafing against and, and pushing back against men's expectation for how women should feel, how women should act, how women should respond to them. Um, and yet, uh, th she's kind of destroying John Alden uh, in the process. Uh, the power, um, at least in this scene, is all in Priscilla's hands. And yet, there really is this threat that Miles Standish is a captain. Miles Standish wears armor, carries a musket, is flanked by guards. He could play the tyrant and force Priscilla to marry him. There, there's always this. There's always this danger that Priscilla. Um, 
even though she's perspicacious in the way that uh, Preciosa is in The Spanish Student, even though rhetorically she's the master of language in Plymouth, Plymouth Colony, still uh, political violence uh, and particularly male violence is always threatening to break in. Now, Priscilla wins the day. Uh, John Alden uh, realizes that he's got to speak for himself, and yet he respects his friend. Now, circumstance works out in John Alden's favor. There's, a, uh, there's an uprising of the indigenous peoples. Miles Standish brusquely rushes off to fight them, and is, uh, he, he, he's horribly offensive to them uh, when he meets a parlay, and uh, they enter into combat, and uh, he's missing in action. Um, and so John Alden and Priscilla are able to um, pursue their love for each other. But at every turn, Priscilla proves herself more virtuous, uh, more wise, more linguistically adept. Now, there's an interesting, there's an interesting moment um, where uh, John Alden comes back and apologizes to, to Priscilla for rudely pressing his friend's suit. No, interrupted the maiden with answer prompt and decisive. No, you were angry with me for speaking so frankly and freely. It was wrong, I acknowledge, for it is the fate of a woman long to be patient and silent, to wait like a ghost that is speechless, till some questioning voice dissolves the spell of its silence. Hence is the inner life of so many suffering women, sunless and silent and deep like subterranean rivers, running through caverns of darkness, unheard, unseen, and unfruitful, chafing their channels of stone with endless and profitless murmurs. Uh, this is quite a, quite a beautiful image of silence. But unlike the sorrow and silence are strong um, lesson that we get in Evangeline, where silence and sorrow are something a woman could voluntarily choose as an ascetic practice, as an ethical discipline, this, this sorrow and silence are enforced by men upon women, and women have to create these inner lives for themselves that, uh, that always stops at the doors of speech, and only when a man asks them can they then speak. Um, and it's interesting because all of this is put into the words of a very forthright woman, um, trying to tell this man, John Alden, who maybe he's the one who's listening ear in Plymouth, in their whole culture, will listen to her. Um, and right after she says this, she then uh, answers prompt and decisive, uh, are the, is the language, um, uh, to John Alden's response. So there's something about Priscilla that she pleads the suit of the silent woman, of the woman who is pressed into silence unjustly, and yet she's bold in her speech. Um, this is played both for comic effect, but also, I think, uh, as a cultural critique. Um, and Longfellow can get away with it because he's writing so far in the future. Now, I'm not sure how much Longfellow is speaking to his own day, but it would be difficult to imagine that he isn't, that he doesn't want us to see Priscilla not just speaking for uh, colonial women, but for 19th century women as well. There's a passage that praises Priscilla uh, that I want to close by looking at, where we see that Priscilla is described in very Puritan and Protestant terms and talked about as a virtuous and upstanding woman, but within the bounds of Puritan theology. And I think this is particularly interesting because Longfellow's heroines up to the point of writing The Courtship of Miles Standish have been Catholics, um, both uh, both Preciosa and Evangeline, they're Catholic women. One's a Spanish Catholic woman. Um, she thinks she's Romani, and then it turns out that she's Spanish, but she lives in Romani uh, culture within a, within a Spanish Catholic framework. Um, and then Evangeline, who um, both is a, is a French Catholic and ends up becoming a nun. Uh, so when he, he can talk about saints, he can talk about... Um, about uh, a sort of uh, uh, language of godlikeness, which he's borrowing from Dante, which he's borrowing from St. Teresa of Avila, uh, who he translated alongside Dante um, from the early church fathers. And yet when he comes to a Puritan maiden, he doesn't have in the theological tradition um, uh, access to um, this sort of saintliness uh, language, but instead he pulls from the scriptures, especially the Old Testament. 
So John Alden um, is thinking about her and thinks about her in terms of Proverbs 31. Ever of her he thought when he read in his Bible on Sunday, praise of the virtuous woman, as she is described in the Proverbs, how the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her always, how all the days of her life she will do him good and not evil, how she seeketh the wool and flax, and worketh with gladness, how she layeth her hand to the spindle, and holdeth the distaff, how she is not afraid of the snow for herself or her household, knowing her household are clothed with the scarlet and cloth of her weaving. There's, a, there's an image um, that's from Longfellow's perspective that kind of is a, is a good companion to this uh, Proverbs 31 interpretation from John Alden's perspective, and it's this. Uh, Priscilla was singing the hundredth psalm, the grand old Puritan anthem, music that Luther sang to the sacred words of the psalmist, full of the breath of the Lord, consoling and comforting many. She, the Puritan girl in the solitude of the forest, making the humble house and the modest apparel of homespun, beautiful with her beauty and rich with the wealth of her being. Now, Longfellow can't help uh, by putting sort of this ontological take. Her being and her beauty um, suffuses both her crafts, uh, she's, she's uh, spinning and sewing, uh, and also the whole environment of her household and of the colony. She suffuses it with her beauty and her being. This, this language of suffusing with being uh, takes a bit more from uh, Dante Boethius um, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Second Peter um, than it does necessarily from the Psalms. Um, and yet when the Psalms are talked of, they're talked about um, through the Protestant tradition, right? Luther is the one who sang these Psalms. It's the Proverbs 31 woman he thinks of, not St. Eulalia um, or... Um, or uh, St. Monica, or any of these more um, uh, Catholic-associated um, praises of her, of her beauty. Long, Longfellow is, is, I think, analyzable at the level of he steps into a tradition and tries to write from within it. Now, of course, there are pitfalls there. There's, there's misunderstanding. There's um, inappropriate appropriation. And yet, I think that he gives his heroines uh, with Preciosa, with Evangeline, and now with Priscilla, their due in trying to fit them into the theological and cultural traditions that they inhabit. And he's always interested in ethical and theological questions with them um, and wants to give them their due when it comes to how they would have understood ethics and theology. Also, all of these women are women who speak out into their cultures, especially Preciosa and Priscilla. Uh, these are women of words who, with their words, with the poetry uh, of their words, who challenge their cultures, who assess their cultures, and who in particular speak into the hearts of the men who usually just want them for wives or for paramours um, and try to help reset the perspectives of the men they're talking to. So Priscilla is a worthy addition to this. Her poem is more comic uh, than the poems we've looked at. And I, and I think, and I, and I talk about this uh, in my book a little bit, in my chapter on Priscilla, I think Priscilla is a character that Longfellow really does his best to uh, have a lot of fun with and to honor. But after he writes Priscilla, he stops writing love stories for a time. I think Longfellow, you know, he's been married for about 15 years. They've had several children together. He, he's, he's very much middle-aged. And I think the, the fires of youth, wanting to tell the youthful love story, um, are kind of passing away in his imagination. And as the 1860s loom, bigger, more ultimate, more apocalyptic questions and characters are going to be on his mind. And we'll explore those in future videos. Thanks so much for listening. I've been Dr. Timothy Bartell.